Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. From 2 Corinthians chapter 9, once again, you will be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Back in 2013, true story, there's a guy named Chris uh, who woke up and found something completely unexpected. Now, Chris had a hobby of selling and buying vintage car parts on eBay, and he'd do about $100 of that per month. And so uh, he woke up one morning and saw his uh, PayPal statement had arrived by email. As he opened it, he saw that his account was currently sitting at negative $92 quadrillion. I rounded the number, so we don't have to go through all of the numbers, but that's 92 with 15 zeros after it. And he said he first did not notice the negative sign, thought he had that much money, and said he would have planned off paying the entirety of our national debt, and if he got a good price, purchased the Philadelphia Phillies. He also said he didn't know what he was going to do if it was in the negative. PayPal quickly realized the error of their ways. They fixed the problem and promised to make a donation to the nonprofit of Chris's choice. And so he picked a nonprofit and then himself made a small donation to a local political party. So I tell you that story, and then we asked the question what would you do if you had 92 quadrillion dollars? Of course, that question's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? Uh, there's no way any of us would ever have that type of money. Not even Bill Gates himself has that much money. But as we consider the idea of generosity, we often assume we need that amount or something equivalent in whatever realm of our life we are considering being generous. We assume we need a large, sizable foundation from which we can give in order to make a noticeable gift, an effective gift, and, and not really hurt ourselves. And so we assume that we've got to have that before we can become generous. And so to paraphrase 1 Corinthians 1, our problem is that not many of us are powerful, not many of us are of noble birth, and then to add to what Paul said there, not many of us are rich, at least according to worldly standards or, or U.S. standards. We're not of the super elite wealthy. In fact, we're pretty average people. I mean, yeah, we may be taller or shorter, we may be uh, older, younger, less hair, more hair, whatever the categories you want to pick, but overall, you and I, we're, we're pretty average. And so as we consider generosity, that's one of our challenges we're facing. How do average people live out a generous lifestyle? As we started stewardship last month, or excuse me, last week, you remember Pastor Marcia started by taking us back to creation, how he uh, showed us that in creation, God well, we'll add some words to what he said. God demonstrated generosity through creation. God spoke everything into existence, and he created all things so that as he set that framework, he set boundaries to creation, and then he provides all things for us to support body and soul, to care for our every need. And God, as that owner, in his generosity, gives it to you. And so then Paul takes it a step further in 2 Corinthians and says that God has now made you rich through that creation. But he's not speaking of a normal type of richness that you and I consider. 2 Corinthians 8, so we'll go one chapter earlier, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you know it, we've heard it, we've learned it, we can state it ourselves, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Paul's not talking about 92 quadrillion dollars that you suddenly have because of Jesus. But what he is speaking about, that 92 quadrillion pales in comparison to. Because in Jesus... 
You are rich in Jesus. You have seen the generosity of our all-creating God and all-powerful God. And that sets the foundation of stewardship that God creates all, is in control of all, and now he gives in his generosity all things to you. But God's richness is more than just physical needs. He also addresses spiritual needs. He addresses the problem of sin. When you look at the ministry of Jesus, how many times do you see Jesus healing someone of some physical ailment? And as you do that, how many times do you see he also forgives their sins? Let's look back to Luke chapter 5. You know the story, remember, where uh, Jesus is teaching inside of a house and some friends, they learn that, and so they gather their one paralyzed friend who's restricted to the mat, and they carry him up to the roof of the house, and they dig a hole in the roof, and they drop the man through the roof in front of Jesus. And first thing Jesus says to him, Luke 5, verse 20, man, your sins are forgiven. First thing. And the Pharisees, they're questioning and they're, they're confused and they're struggling. How can anyone have the power to forgive sins? To which Jesus responds in verse 23, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? Of course, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven, right? Because no one knows that for sure except the Father. But if you say rise and walk, that's much harder because now you can see if they have power. Now you can see if that's true. So Jesus asked, what's easier, to say your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. See, Jesus, he's concerned about the physical needs that we have. But he's equally, if not more, concerned about the spiritual needs as well. And in Jesus both the physical and the spiritual are now linked together as the gifts of God, the generosity of God, both come through Him. And we need both from God. We believe, teach, and confess that God cares for all of our needs. And that's true spiritually as well as physically. And that's where Paul is coming from as he starts today's text. Chapter 9, verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency, again, spiritual and physical, all sufficiency, God providing for all of your needs, in all things at all times, you may abound in all good works. God's grace leads to good works. It is a natural outflow it is the intended result. God's grace leads to good works. The good works are the external evidence of the internal work that God has accomplished for you and to you through Jesus. Generosity is natural. God demonstrates it. We saw that in creation. God demonstrates generosity and he expects his people to live in that generosity, to live out that generosity as well. And so maybe instead of asking, what are you going to do with 92 quadrillion dollars? Maybe the more natural question, a more appropriate question for us is, what are you going to do with the generosity that God has given to you in Jesus? How is that generosity going to manifest itself, going to, going to express itself through your life? Because however you answer that question, that's the indicator, that's the, the thermometer, that's the temperature of your spiritual health. You go visit a doctor, uh, what's the first thing you got to do, especially if it's a new visit or you haven't been there in a while, you got to fill out that long form of paperwork, don't you? Uh, yes and no's of every aspect of your life or before you begin a a physical uh, training of any sort or new exercise program you know they always want you to check the boxes make sure that you are okay to at least begin that starting point point. and so we're used to answering these questions to examine our physical health but the Bible does the same thing for us not to the extent of the doctor not in the same way but the Bible challenges us to examine our health see that word generosity in today's text it's a unique word uh, we find it eight times in the entirety of the New Testament, five times in 2 Corinthians, and, and four of those are in today's text and the surrounding chapters. So it's a, 
a unique word, not one that's common. And sometimes it's translated in other spots, not as generosity, but it's translated as sincere. So we see this link between generosity and sincerity, that our generosity is not just something we begrudgingly do or we uh, kind of regret doing, but generosity is something that God calls us to be sincere in our doing. And then to push it even farther, that same word generosity has the same root word as the word health or healthy. And we see that same word coming into play in Luke chapter 11. Jesus says this, Your eye is the lamp to your body. When your eye is healthy, there's our same word. So maybe we can understand that even a little bit more. When your eye is generous, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Your eye is is that place of health, of generous, of, of sincerity. And if it is, if you are looking in that right place, if you are looking to Jesus, your full body now is, is full of light, is full of health, as Christ now burns bright inside of you. Where you are looking and who you are looking to, it matters. And as we consider generosity, when we look to Jesus, the source of all generosity, well, now suddenly... It affects who we are, and it changes us. Now, I'll make an argument. In fact, I firmly believe we as a society are living in a very generous time. Uh, The people that surround us, uh, the places that we live, we're very generous people. It's natural to who we are right now. And it's true. We are generous. We're, We're very generous with our temper, with our attitude, with our disdain. We're we're very generous and we give freely of resentment, revenge, and even frustrations. We're very generous. We're naturally generous with our sarcasm, slams, and backstabbing. We're generous in ways that we ensure that my needs are met and my rights are defended and who cares about anyone else as long as I am comfortable. We're generous when that temptation feels good or that sin just boy, I don't want to leave that one alone. But that's part of the problem, isn't it? Because we're used to being generous, but God is calling us to a different health, a different generosity, and He demonstrates that generosity as Jesus gives of Himself and gives of Himself completely to the point of death, even death on the cross, so that we now receive something different. And our richness, it can't be quantified. It's, it's something completely different than what we can even examine because the, gener- the richness that we have is what comes through faith. As we look to Jesus, our richness and generosity, it's not dependent upon where we are right now, how we feel, or our current circumstances of life. Our richness and generosity is found in Jesus as we are rich in Him who gives us a generous heart as we are now united to Him, connected to Him through baptism. You want to be more generous? Look to Jesus. Because it's not dependent upon our life right now or what we have. At least that's the story that Bill Gates shares. Now, as far as I know, this is a true story. I couldn't find anything to tell me it wasn't. Likewise, I couldn't find anything that told me it was uh, actually true. So we're going to just take it as it is. Now, there's a story that's told about Bill Gates, though. Uh, Before he became rich and famous, one day he was flying into New York City. And as he landed, he wanted to pick up a newspaper, but he didn't have the right change in his pocket. And so the newspaper vendor said, just take the newspaper, don't worry about it. Gates was hesitant, but did what the vendor said. Two to three months later, same story. He flies into New York City, goes to pick up a newspaper, doesn't have the right change. The vendor says, take it. Same newspaper vendor Gates says, I can't do it. You already gave it to me once. And the guy says, just take it. I'm giving it to you out of my profit. It's not going to be a loss to me. Uh, Just take it. So then 19 years later or so, as Bill Gates is already rich and famous at this point, he remembers this newspaper vendor, and it takes at least a month and a half, if not two months or more, to find this guy. And after this newspaper vendor is found, 
Gates then approaches him and tells him, ask of anything, what can I do to thank you for the generosity you showed me earlier? And the newspaper vendor responded saying, you're never going to be able to match the help that I gave to you. He said, I helped you when you were poor. And, or no, excuse me. He said, I helped you when I was a poor vendor. And now that you are rich, you think your generosity is able to match what I first gave to you? And at that moment, Bill Gates realized, in spite of the richness and fame that he had accumulated, he was not the richest guy in earth. Because richness does not depend on what you have or the circumstances that you are in. Richness is dependent upon what is found inside. And we know what is found inside because Christ has renewed us and he has given you a new heart and he has demonstrated that love for you. You have a richness that is beyond what anyone else can ever see because it comes from Christ. And you have all that you need. So what are you going to do with that richness? What are you going to do with all that God has given? How are you going to be generous? And the problem we have in generosity is that if we have this much, whatever this might be, and we are generous with it, and now suddenly we have this much, we've lost this. We've, we've created a gap in what we once had and what we now have. And the problem in generosity is we're often afraid, how are we going to fill that gap? Going back to our earlier comment, we feel like we need a sizable foundation, a firm foundation before we can give. But you remember what we said last week? God, in his generosity, as the creator of all things, promises to care for your every need. So if you have this, and you're generous, and you're reduced to this, God is going to continue to fill and provide for your needs. Does it mean it's going to go back to where it once was? Not necessarily. But you're never going to be lacking when Jesus is near. That's what we heard earlier. For your sake he became poor, so that by so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. That's where generosity begins. And that's where we find our stewardship today. That Christ has done all things for you and now guides you to respond through generosity. You can't give 92 quadrillion. I don't know if anyone can give that amount. But we can do something greater. We can give the hope of Jesus. We can live out our faith we can show a living and active faith in all aspects of our lives. And as we do, we start to see the reality of 2 Corinthians 9, verse 11, our theme verse coming to play. You will be enriched in every way, so that being generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds together with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time we